Hello everybody, welcome to today's show. My name is Spencer Walsh. Thank you so much for joining us. Can't believe how fast this Saturday morning has flown by already. But we are here today to bring you some of the most important news. And we start with a trip back to Afghanistan where... After the airport um, attacks that killed 12 Americans and many, many more, 100 plus uh, Afghanis, the United States has struck back, killing two of the ISIS militants involved in that. Also, no labels. The right wing, um, or not right wing, but right wing within the Democratic Party, uh, Super PAC, has offered to pay certain Democratic members hundreds of thousands of dollars to spurn a fundraiser from Nancy Pelosi. We'll take a look at how that went. And Bill Maher, just with some awful, awful uh, takes last night on Afghanistan that we can bring you since we did the show on a Saturday afternoon. All right. Can't believe I'm Saturday afternoon already. Where's all the time go, right? All right. Yeah, so we're starting with this crazy situation in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, you really had the sense that this evacuation, which had really been, because people are going to, you know, be, uh, put their own spin on it, but this, there is no denying that in terms of the people who had gotten out, and I mean, unless you want to advance the case that Biden and the State Department are lying about how many people they're getting out of Afghanistan, I mean, it's very subjective how much people, you know, they still need to get out because everyone has a different definition of who we still need to get out. I mean, you could take out a lot of people, you could take out a lot of refugees, you could take a lot of people that helped helped us um, but if you, after, after a certain point, once you get started, you, you really, there's no real reason to stop. Like once you expand the, um, you know, justifications broad enough, and I'm saying that it's not a good idea. It certainly is. Um, but you know, <laughs> the question is, will we see people, some more, you know, skeptical, cynical people out there make make it a justification for prolonging our military involvement there, which is not necessarily something we have to do because we have this really awkward, you know, place that a lot of conservatives are in where they want to criticize Biden, you know, for leaving our our friends, our Afghan friends behind. But, of course, they have to, you know, I was watching actually Tucker Carlson last night and he was like, you know, striking his tone perfectly. It's like, yeah, um, no, no one should, you know, dispute that we must bring in all the Afghan people who helped us. But, you know, those people, they're unvetted, you know, they're unvetted. They're going to bring, it's going to be very, very scary. Um, but yeah, that is kind of the Tucker Carlson classic that he so quickly and deftly um, hits on. But let's get you up to date on what's going on here in the Kabul airport where U.S. military officials say they have killed two people involved in the planning and carrying out of a suicide bombing attack in Kabul's airport in a retaliatory airstrike carried out in the mountainous region on, of Afghanistan. This, these ISIS-K folks, which folks, I don't know about this this one, you know, uh, I, I have to learn a little bit more about this ISIS-K situation, um, but it's not really redounding well to disprove my theory that someone in the intelligence community wanted to make this go as hard for Biden as it possibly could. And all of a sudden, yeah, ISIS is back, folks, and they have a new letter. What? Anyway, so the reprisal attack, which officials said wounded another, um, wounded another, <laughs> wounded, <laughs> jeez, um, came as the clock was winding down for Biden's August 31st deadline. That's just in three days, people. It's getting very close. It's getting it's getting very tight. It's next Tuesday that uh, Biden will have to get all troops out of Afghanistan, or at least get U.S. military out of Afghanistan, because uh, the Taliban have said, hey, if you're going to keep them there, we are going to start really firing um, come uh, September 1st. So, yeah, the Pentagon has updated the information on the retaliatory strike on Saturday, saying a second person had been killed. Um, you know, adding adding this all up. At the Kabul airport, there were indications on Saturday the evacuation effort was steadily slowing. Roads leading to the airport were closed, and large crowds that strained in recent days to push inside had dissipated in the aftermath of Thursday's suicide bombing. So that, that gate area was the real hot spot where we saw that suicide bombing take place. Um, that was very, very scary for a lot of people and really was a great way of discouraging people trying to enter the airport. Um, 
And, you know, with this whole dynamic, it's apparently it's it was ISIS-K and the Taliban didn't have too much of a, you know, they didn't really know about it. But we still, you know, we do have a lot to learn uh, about the situation, no doubt about it. So U.S. roads leading to the airport were closed and large crowds that had strained in recent days they obviously dissipated. And 100,000 of Afghanistan's are, uh, Afghans are thought to... Uh, be seeking an escape from the country, fearing Taliban rule. But Biden and other global leaders have acknowledged that many will not get out before the deadline. And this, I think, is going to be very, very interesting because these numbers, I have not really seen good ones, and they are so, so subjective to any interpretation of how Biden's done on this patrol. Like, how many Americans are getting out, how many Afghans are getting out. And really, what we are also looking at here, I think it's going to be very interesting and very important to check, is the political standards here. Like, what is the new, um, like, how, how toughly uh, will Biden be punished for failing to get, you know, maybe, you know, a certain amount of uh, Republican or, you know, Americans out? Will this be like, you know, a Benghazi? And the question is, does Benghazi have or, you know, is there a cultural climate in this country sufficient to pull all those same strings that Republicans did with, the, with, with Benghazi, you know, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama dishonoring America, turning, turning their backs on our troops. American men have died, you know, like, to get, you know, get those outrage pleasure, pleasure centers going, um, which can be really dangerous for Democrats in, you know, in political terms and just the way they, you know, people perceive them, uh, you know, in this post 9 level climate. But how strong is that post 9 level climate? That is what is worth knowing. Like, that is going to be a really interesting test. Like, the fact that Biden, of all people, was able to do this is another great indication. And the polling, you know, it's not been great, obviously, especially with the media coverage, but it hasn't been awful. Um, and that is another, it's going to be another really big test to see, you know, does Biden lose because of this in the midterms, or does he lose because of something else, most likely domestic agenda? I, I'm going to say it's likely that he does lose in the midterms, but because of something else, not because of the, you know, do, not because of anything he's doing here in Afghanistan. Um, but as as we've talked about, it, the media reaction has just been insanely, insanely harsh. People have been pushing this time and time again. Um, so, yeah, yeah. so U- U.S. troops were screening Afghans at the Abbey Gate when the suicide bomber detonated on Thursday, killing 13 U.S. troops and as many as 170 other people, one of the deadliest attacks since the U.S.-led invasion began. Uh, Abbey Gate was all but closed on Saturday. So this is, you know, several hours ahead. Day is almost over now in Afghanistan. Um, and Abbey Gate, one of the main entrances to the airport, was pretty much closed. Uh, so the U.S. military said on Friday it launched a retaliatory attack in the Nangahar province, east of Kabul. Uh, Captain Bill Urban, a spokesman for CENTCOM, said in a statement the airstrike had targeted ISIS at K planner. He was referring to the Islamic State affiliate in Afghanistan, known as Islamic State Khorasan, which is claiming responsibility for the airport attack. So, new ISIS alert, folks. We gotta love it. Initial indications are that we killed the target. Captain Urban said we have no civilian casualties. An assistant to the Taliban spokesman, Zabila Muhajid, said on Thursday in response to the U.S. airstrike, we've heard about reports on the Nangahar incident, but we were trying to find the type of the incident and the casualties after investigation will react to that. So this pretty much is going to be interesting to see how the United States resp- or Taliban responds to the United States doing these military operations in their country. Because if it were me, if I were trying to run a country, I would not like a country that just been operating the country I was trying to occupying and operating the country I was trying to run for you know the past twenty years coming in and blowing something up. Uh, if I were the Taliban, I would not be too happy about that. Um, but so that could, you know, provoke that, that reaction there. I think it's going to be very, very interesting to watch. So Britain's evacuation of citizens will end on Saturday and the country will begin bringing its remaining troops home, says General Nick Carter, chief of defense staff. And France, too, has ended its evacuations, uh, French officials said on Friday. Because of the continuing security threat, U.S. officials are again warning Americans to leave the airport area. American officials believe that another terror attack in Kabul is likely Um the threat is ongoing and it is active. Our troops are still in danger, Jen Psaki said Friday. So hopefully ISIS-K stays well away of Americans through the uh, evacuation process, which has been pretty remarkable in terms of how efficient and how quick it's been in terms of getting people out. Um, of course, the biggest takeaways are, you know, this this whole ISIS-K situation and who gets to decide the number of, Amer- of, of 
people that were left behind? Like, is it going to be Biden coming in and saying, oh, we pretty much just got everybody, a few Afghan allies and, you know, stubborn Americans who want to stay. They are, and, you know, it's to, to his point, it is tough to get everybody in America, to, uh, you know, every Afghan, especially dual citizens in America to leave, or in Afghanistan to leave. If they don't want to leave, they do not have to leave. And there's nothing really they can Biden can do about it and force them. But is that a political loss that Biden's going to take, or will he be able to spin it properly? Um, I don't know. But trusting Biden to be his own best advocate is always a, shall we say, uncertain proposition. All right. Back in a minute. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our segment to tell you all about what's going on here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network this summer. We do, as I'm sure you know, have a great lineup available for you. We, of course, start with our flagship show, Newsflash, all new Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, uncultured, um, irregularly, back every Saturday with live music and sports analysis. With my co-host of the summer, Bennett Laxon, Hidden History will be brand new every Thursday on a bit of a hiatus, but will return shortly. It's the summer of podcasting. It's the summer of sounds. All you got to do is just keep listening wherever you get your podcasts, always here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. All right, yeah, that Hidden History episode, by the way, it is out now, talking about some of the history of Afghanistan leading up this moment, just putting this whole situation in context. Very, very interesting stuff. It was uh, fun to research it about yesterday, and uh, here we are talking about it in current context, but not now, because we are turning the page over to The Intercept, uh, where they're talking about the Dark Money Group, No Labels, offering to raise $2,000 for two of the so-called Unbreakable Nine. These are the House Democrats faction blocking the party's agenda this week. These right-wing Democrats who say, pass the bipartisan infrastructure now so we can try and stop or forestall and in some way lessen the big uh, human infrastructure bill, the $3.5 trillion bill that Biden and Bernie are trying to push through. So, those two Democrats are Carolyn Bordeaux of Georgia, who is in probably one of the most kind of bellwethery swing districts in the country in this, you know, suburban Atlanta area that has seen huge red to blue swings in recent years. Obviously, with the 2020 election was a big deal, following up that with the Georgia Senate situation. Um, yeah, so obviously their appearance would have created awkward optics. So Vicente Gonzalez says that, you know, I think Texas, Texas border Democrat, Texas Democrats never really to uh, left wing. Their appearance would have created awkward optics again for the no labels group because this group had been working on a project to form a united front of opposition to Pelosi's legislative agenda, which hinges on a plan to back a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill in order to maintain leverage, um, hold back a vote on the, bi- vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill in order to maintain leverage over a com- complementary $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. The larger package includes significant tax increases on private equity barons and other wealthy individuals who fund no labels, and the group has unleashed a flood of money in order to stop it. So, Bordeaux, the offer did not work on her. She stuck by Nancy Pelosi and attended her fundraiser. Gonzalez, though, canceled his appearance, um, his appearance at the fundraiser, but said, no agreements, we did not do any anything like that. Um, says Isaac Baker, a senior advisor to Gonzalez. Margaret White also denied it, saying, quote, this is false. Um, on Tuesday afternoon, after a group, after the group secured a promise of a floor vote on the infrastructure plan by September 27th, this is really going to be a procedural uh, floor vote, so not so, just going to something to move the bill along. It will not be passed on September 27th, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, which still should leave the, them uh, time to get the bipart or the the big one through in the house. Um, so after they secured the promise, um, Gottheimer, the leader of the re- rebellion um, from New Jersey, suburban New Jersey, real insane guy, Bordeaux, Jerry Golden of Maine, Kurt Schrader of Oregon, um, they gathered on a Zoom with dozens of no labels donors for a victory lap. Um, 
Gottheimer, really, really adorable stuff here. He says, you should all feel so proud. I can't explain to you. This is the culmination of all your work. This would not have happened, but for what you built. It just would not have happened. Hard stop. You should feel so proud. This is your win as much as it is my win. The call was led by Andrew Bursky, the manager of Atlas Holdings, a major private equity fund in Connecticut, which operates heavily in the construction and development sectors. When it comes to their ringleader, private equity guys who fill his campaign accounts at one House source, reflecting the broadly held view among House Democrats that the effort by Gottheimer and the label was singularly focused on preventing tax increases on the wealthy corporations and tax advantage sectors like private equity and hedge funds. Um, saying that no labels progresses to value bipartisanship, but from my experience, they value by BUY partisanship, says Representative Mark Pocan, a former no labels member who resigned from the group when they declined to disclose no uh, disclosed donor identity. So now it's a big progressive caucus guy. So he really flipped um, because, I don't know, maybe he was a little bit naive about their intentions coming into politics. Um yeah, like really, this is a really, r- pretty remarkable story. So there no labels out there doing anything they can to try and stop the passage of this agenda. Um, and it's not even that big. It's not even that crazy. Like there's just some, you know, remedial standard, what would be, you know, a standard Democratic infrastructure bill. Like it's not like super hard right. It's not like what, you know, some of those right wing factions in the Democratic Party may want. But and it's not definitely not what people on the Bernie side would have, you know, dreamed of. But there is a bunch of good stuff in there. It's a very solid, you know, kind of, you know, progressive, middle of the road, democratic bill that nobody in, you know, any kind of establishment circle is allowing at all to go through, which I think is very, very telling. And it really is telling the amount of power these guys are willing to influence, you know, dropping $200,000 in each person's campaign if they, just if they don't even attend a fundraiser, because trust me, they're going to be getting a lot more than $200,000 for the next re-election campaign from no labels, all nine of them, but they, you know, they're just getting a little signing bonus, like the upfront to not attend this fundraiser was $200,000, um, so these efforts by no labels donors came as corporate groups have pushed to defeat the infrastructure, um, you know, the infrastructure bill, and obviously defeat the investments in combating inequality funded through taxes on the wealthy in certain business sectors. The finance industry had deployed dozens of lobbyists on Capitol Hill to block the infrastructure provisions centered on increasing taxes on private equity. Business Roundtable, which represents the chief executives of the largest publicly traded companies in America, has retained former Democratic staffers to fight the tax provisions. So we got these Democratic, like these Democratic weasels, you know, coming out here being like, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and get in the way of my party actually making a good step. And, you know, this is so much of what D.C. is. And when people go into these Democratic circles, they're not going to try and pass great big infrastructure bills that actually make people's lives better. What they're going to do is to just do this, this lobbying shit, exactly later. Just a little bit down the road. They kick the can down the road. Just a little bit. And that has been so, so key and clear to see. Um, the efforts by no labels donors came as corporate groups have pushed to defeat the investments uh, again of this you know infrastructure bill. Where the House concession on infrastructure amounts to a win is dubious and hotly debated on Capitol Hill. But there's no question no labels has organized its donors to fight the taxing and spending battles of the Biden administration. In June, no labels co-founder Nancy Jacobson, the spouse of operative Mark Penn, a real Democratic Clinton, you know, fixer guy who's also a mentor to Godheimer, which explains a lot, was explicit in her plan to use donor money to quote reward members of Congress who voted the way the organization existed, according to audio of another private meeting the Intercept obtained this month. That was the one he did uh, with Joe Manchin. So she says um, now the truth is, there's no group in the center that's putting together the hard dollars. Um, the term hard dollars refers to money given directly to a candidate for federal office, which candidates find more valuable than outside spending because they have full control over their own funds, whereas super PACs make their own spending decisions, technically. You know, you're not supposed to coordinate with the super PAC and the candidate. Candidates have also also have access to discounted television commercial rates while outside groups pay the full freight. Jacobson noted that dark money organizations put up big numbers. It's a lot of soft dollars. Um, it's a lot of super PACs. It's things they don't control. They love the hard dollars, and I would be hard-pressed to think of a group 
that can raise this sort of money. Our hope is at least $20 million over the cycle with this group and hopefully keep doubling it as we go. So they're planning to raise a lot of money for these guys. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out politically. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. It's News Flash. You are listening to News Flash, and today we have a very, very exciting final story. You'll love to see it. Um, this is Bill Maher reacting to this now. Yeah, this is his segment on Afghanistan. This should be fun. And finally, new rule, blind hatred of America is just as blinkered as blind love. And we, and we Americans should really get some perspective about where we live. It's called live. facts, Bill. Sorry Watching about that. Watching the shit go down in Afghanistan, I was reminded lately of every conversation I've ever had with an immigrant, almost all of which, if we got to really talking, included the notion, oh, you people have no idea. All you do is bitch about and badmouth your own country. But if you knew about the country I came from... And, and again, keep in mind, this, these are the people who actively... You know, Bill Maher, for example, he, he's, he's the type of guy to go on TV and be like, you know, these Muslims, you know, they're a little bit antisocial. He literally said, you know, you talk to people dating Arab guys, they don't have good reviews. As if to say, these people are, you know, subhuman from another, like, they're not on the same plane. Like, the, 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 that is the case he's trying to make. There's, there's insane, mouth-dropping compilations of Bill Maher's just complete and insane racism against Muslims, and this is a guy who's, like, trying to tell you that you should not complain. You should not complain about the awful, awful crap your country does to other people abroad. You should not complain about that, because you're living a good life, and so am I, because all my immigrant friends that I totally talk to in, you know, wherever the hell I live in Hollywood or whatever... Um, they all tell me, you know, how deep and tough the struggles are. So that's why you should not complain about your country at all and accept whatever things they want to do to people in other countries. Just absolutely twisted, twisted, warped, warped um, logic. You'd stop shitting on your own. Yeah, and what if I was shitting on my own because the people who... Di- who caused these problems for the other countries are from my country. They're from my country. The people who p- caused the problems in Afghanistan are literally from America. That is why people are shitting on America. It's because they cause problems for the people that Bill Maher is now pretending to care about because he wants to look good. Now, <clears throat> right? I have never been a rah-rah America type and, in fact, have often made fun of Republicans in the past for being overly sentimental because they're the ones who tear up at military flyovers and get a boner when the governor of South Dakota rides into a biker rally dressed like a painting at Teddy Roosevelt. (laughs) John Boehner used to cry, cry, like fucking weep. At the drop of a hat, if anything reminded him of what a star-spangled miracle this country is, if there was a little flag in his club sandwich, he'd lose it. (laughs) It's just in the conservative DNA to have this dewy-eyed, sloppy, drunk love for their country that often renders them incapable of acknowledging its problems. That's how we got the 2013 Supreme Court ruling gutting the Voting Rights Act? Not because John Roberts is a monster, but because people like him tend to over-romanticize America. He thought the South was ready for the honor system. They weren't. (laughs) But... This is why, like, you never get anywhere listening to people like him, because you don't understand what's actually going on. You don't understand why... Like, John Roberts is not doing that because he thought, oh, yeah, the South is ready for, you know, they're ready to, you know care about black people again. No, it's because he thought that the people who put him in that position in the first place, which is the Federalist Society, which had been a big donor, big business funded operation going back decades, thought that he would be the person that would be good enough in place to pass decisions like that, to stop voting rights, to stop, you know, control of, um, you know, you know, egalitarian system, any kind of egalitarian system in the South in terms of democracy. Um, 
he was put in place to do things like that by big business people that so Republicans would win and pass big business policies. That is just how that works. And you don't get that from watching anybody on mainstream media. You just think, oh, you know, John Roberts. He's just such a nice guy. He's just such a nice guy. He just wants this country to, you know, no, succeed. And so does everybody in power. We should not change a thing. It's all good. It's completely fine. No one needs to worry about it. Uh, like, this is this is the big problem with people like Bill Maher. And that's why they're losing so much credibility. But liberals, as usual in this era, have now gone too far in the other direction. They under-romanticize America. They have no perspective. Last week, the Taliban murdered a comedian. His name was Nazar Mohammed. And he made up funny songs on TikTok. They forced him into a car, tortured, and then executed him. A comedian. A thing like that hits a little close to home for me. I've had two presidents up my ass. This one warned me to stop speaking my mind. Oh, he's so brave. To to watch what they say, watch what they do. And this is not a time for remarks like that. There never is. And this one sued me over a joke. Yeah, Bill Maher, not only is he a great friend to immigrants, but he's also a brave truth, for the truth speaker. Predicting he'd do exactly what, what, a, he what did. a joke. This crazy Bill Maher, this idiot comedian, these people are sick. He's a crazy lunatic. He's a whack job. He is a total nut job. <laughs> This is just like so. It's not even interesting. It's not even like exciting. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, neither experience was pleasant. But I didn't have to worry about being dragged till I'm dead behind a Toyota Tacoma. Have a little perspective about the stuff we howl about here. I'm. S- I'm sorry your professor said something you didn't like. That won't be a problem with the Taliban because you're not allowed to go to school. In Saudi Arabia, grown women can be jailed for doing the kind of things we think of as routine without the permission of a male guardian. China rounds you up if you're the wrong religion and puts you in camps. More children in Burkina Faso work than are in school. Only 5% of Burundians have electricity. The homicide rate in Honduras is eight times what it is here. The inflation rate in Venezuela is 2,719%. And this is why, like, Bill Maher, I've often said, like, he's not, like, super hard one way or left or right or something. It's like, it's not really sensible, I think, to put him down as, like, one ideological position. Because the thing with him is he is a child. Like, he's not, like, super liberal conservative first. He's, like, a child first. Like, he's the brain of and processing information of a child. Like, he just hasn't, you know, read a book, you know, hasn't thought about things a different way. Like, and he he's the person who thinks, like, it is a sophisticated point. It's a point worth respecting to say that not only can we, you know... It's 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 incredibly cheap and you know lame to oh this is the woke culture thing you know we we shouldn't be like who even knows he's being very you know purposely I think vague about the the complaints Americans have and you know how justified they are um, and of course the people who have been trying to tie you know Afghanistan back to woke politics are always very very funny but like the idea that you can <laughs> like you can walk around and say that oh Burkina Faso. That country's in a bad way. Venezuela, that country's in a bad way. And he, we, 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 you're not allowed to go like, criticize or, you know, trying to improve your own country because um, other countries are in a bad way. In Burkina Faso, you know, there's a you know, high homicide rate. Honduras, you know, that's not a, good, not a good place to be right now. Yes, like, we get it. And something that you don't get that a lot of other people get, Bill Maher, is that the United States had a role in doing a lot of that stuff. People... Like him, people who, by the way, yes, do over idolize America and think that Muslims are, you know, monkeys and second rate people. You know, they bring that desert stuff. That's a direct quote that desert stuff. Uh, Bill Maher says that's what the Muslims contribute to our society. Um, and like, when you have people like that, they just don't know how to process 
the world in an, an adult way. Like, they just had, you know, like, the first political opinions you ever have. Like, normally you go on past those political opinions. And that, you know, very basic, like, five-year-old view of the world. But, you know, some people, they just haven't. And some, some of them still are lucky enough to get shows on TV. The Philippines, in the last five years, has put to death 27,000. Is he really just going to go through every bad country? If you think like, America is really? irredeemable, turn on the news or get a passport and a ticket on one of those sketchy airlines that puts its web address on the plane. There's a reason Afghan mothers are handing their babies to us. Right. And... And we should take them. Americans, right now, should take in Afghan refugees into their homes and into their neighborhoods. All right, he's right about that. He's right about that. But the thing he will never put together, he'll never put two and two together, you know, if, like you saw that, you know, famous, amazing clip uh, with him and Glenn Greenwald, is that, you know, America, they, sometimes, they bear responsibility for this stuff. They bear responsibility. The war in Afghanistan, it was not just a mistake. Like, the, you know, the war in Iraq, not just a mistake. Those are absolute crimes on people that need to be addressed. And America should be held accountable for them. Because maybe this is something you'll understand, you know, truth and facts, you know, all those, you know, ridiculous buzzwords that you like to throw around to mean pretty much basically whatever you want them to mean, you know, you gotta hold some people accountable sometimes. And, you know, why... There's no better place to start uh, with than your own front door. your Your own house. Get your own house in order. That's pretty much what I'm saying. If you're people like, you know, Bill Maher or all these people who are freaking out about whatever the hell they are freaking out about nowadays. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to News Flash. Maybe going to be back with an uncultured tonight. Keep it posted.